1934 in Southern California. Um, obviously, a long time ago, 1934, Southern California, there was a high school student with a troubled past. He was a troubled young man involved in stealing, uh, beating up other kids, just a really troubled past. Uh, was a son of, an, of Italian immigrants uh, in California. And uh, this kid was an incredible athlete, incredible athlete. Faster than anyone that he ever competed against. Uh, he was just one of those guys that you watch on an, on a, on an, as an athlete and you're just in shock and awe of him or, that, or her, that person. It's just, wow, they are better than everybody else. They just have a gifting and a skill. In his last year of high school, this guy ran a mile in four minutes and 21 seconds, which at the time was unheard of. And many believed that he was gonna be the first to eclipse, un, to eclipse an under four minute mile. In college, he did a four minute and nine second mile. Uh, but he uh, really, his high school record, it lasted for over 20 years, this four minute and 21 second mile. Uh, later that same year after high school, uh, he, uh, he, complete, he competed in the Olympics. There's been some movies written about him recently. You may have heard of him. His name is Luis or Louis Zamperini. There was a uh, uh, that movie, The Unbroken. It's got a book and a movie. Great, great story. Uh, he was set to star in the 1940 Olympics, but they were canceled because of World War II. Zamperini became a fighter pilot and on a rescue mission, his plane crashed in the middle of the ocean with 11 members on board. Only a few of them survived, Zamperini being one of them. They were on, in the ocean for 47 days, stranded in the ocean, and finally, at some point, landed on a shore, listen to this, 2,000 miles away from the crash site. 2,000 miles away from the crash site, 47 days in the sea, floating aimlessly, and just so happened to land in Japan and became a prisoner of war, was in captivity for two years. The military declared him dead uh, because they didn't know about him. They, they didn't know where he was or what was happening to him. But for two years, he was treated horribly and inhumanely and beaten because of his star status of being a, a U.S. Olympian, just a horrible, horrible situation. Finally, after the war was over in 1945, he was released. At first, Post-war life was difficult for Louis Zamperini. Uh, alcoholism, anger, depression, PTSD, all of the above. You can imagine all the things that he was going through after being in captivity, captivity for two years and struggling through those situations. His wife almost divorced him. Tough situation, family situation. That was until 1949. Zamperini found himself by the dragging of his wife at a Billy Graham tent revival in L.A. County. 1949, Louis Zamperini responded to the gospel and started the process of healing. Someone that endured so many hardships and undue pain could have had the opportunity to let it affect him the rest of his life, to live with anger and depression and PTSD and just let it affect him the rest of his life, but he didn't. In the latter part of his life, Louis Zamperini went on to found Victory Boys Camp, which is a, was a retreat for troubled boys, much like himself as a young man, to reach out and to minister and to love on these young kids that were troubled and restore them back to a normal society. And even went on to meet later on in his life, he went on to meet some of his tormentors in Japan and in person, face to face, forgave them. A beautiful story of redemption. Beautiful story of redemption. Today, as we dive back into the story of Paul and the Philippians, we get to see the real nature of Paul. We get to see this, this sense of, of humanity, but really the true character of Paul at the same time. That just like Louis Zamperini had a lot of hurt and struggles and pains, but on a greater level, he didn't let his circumstances determine or hinder his work. Last week, we started, a, uh, started in Philippians chapter one. We're in week three of a series on Philippians titled Home, where Paul says later on in first, first, uh, first, uh, sorry, Philippians one, where he says that, where is your citizenship? Where's your home? We are citizens of heaven. And so we're taking that theme throughout this whole book of how we live our lives in a world uh, that is not our home, how do we live our lives and why it's important to us. And so last week, we 
in the first part of chapter one, verse 11 verses, where we see how much Paul loves this church. He planted this church. He loves this church. He cares for this church and he desires for them to grow. He says, I want you to grow in love and knowledge and discernment. I want you to grow in those areas into which brings unity. And so today, as we jump in, we jump past the pleasantries and past the intros and really Paul just gets straight to work. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in chapter one, verses 12 through 18. So let's read this together. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest, of, and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having been become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some, indeed, preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I put here that I'm here for the defense of the gospel. For the former, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, that Christ is proclaimed in that, in that I rejoice. I want to give you the main idea this morning, if you're taking notes. The main idea is, is that circumstances didn't keep Paul from proclaiming the gospel, and it shouldn't stop us. Circumstances didn't keep Paul from pro proclaiming the gospel, and it shouldn't stop us. I hope that you are seeing a theme from Paul over the last couple of weeks. And really, if you were to read any of his letters and looking at the early church, you can see how much the proclamation, the sharing of the gospel is important to the early church and should be to us as well. When you read the words of Paul, you realize how often he talks about it, that it's something that's on the forefront of his mind. Uh, and you might even be thinking there in your seat, in your chair, your comfortable chair, wow, another sermon on preaching the gospel. Come on, Derek, we've, there's so much more in the, in the Bible. We got to cover a lot more than that. But listen, we will talk about it often because it is the way that God has designed the church and his kingdom to grow. It is the way that God has designed his church to grow. It's the way he grows the kingdom. So we don't grow because we're streaming our services on Facebook or on YouTube. We don't grow because of that. We grow because of the proclamation, the sharing of the gospel. And so God wants to use you. He wants to use myself into growing his church. And so we're gonna preach this message until Christ comes back because it's our mission. So I want us to look at verse 12. If you have your Bibles, let's just keep, keep your finger there. If you're new with this, we go verse by verse uh, studying and diving into these passages. And so just keep your, your, your finger in place there. Philippians chapter one, verse 12 says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. My imprisonment is for Christ. This verse is interesting to me because Paul says, I want you to know what has happened to me. Then he gives no details. He's like, I want you to know what is happening. He kind of leaves us on a cliffhanger, so to speak. It's like, uh, he doesn't give us the details. Modern day journalism would look down or frown upon this kind of writing. They would want to know a detailed transcript of who's, who his visitors were and what they were talking about. They would want to know what kind of meals was he eating? How many meals a day was he eating? They would like to know details of what the conditions of the prison were like. Not Paul. He just says, I want you to know what has happened to me, but he doesn't give us any details. The only thing that we really know is that Paul is in chains in prison. This is a really good picture of what it's like in our house with Lindsay and I. Uh, I don't want to say for all guys because we're all different, but after a long day at work or a phone call or a conversation that sounds interesting, Lindsay will say, how was that? And with all the detail and the, the, the detail that I can muster up, I will look at her and I will say this almost every time. I will say, it was good. And that's it. I'm, I don't give a lot of detail. She's, she has to like pull it out of me. It's like, oh, you want to know more details. That's just kind of, that's kind of the sense that I get with Paul. He's like, I want you to know what has happened to me. But he doesn't go into great detail. He says, because I, I believe what Paul's motivation was is that he wasn't trying to glorify a situation of being in prison or being in chains. What he really want, he really wanted the Philippians to know one thing is that his being in chains was serving to advance the gospel. 
Now think about that for a moment. Remember the Philippians, they partnered with Paul financially for the advancement of, of the gospel, but now he's in chains. Chains are meant to restrict, they're meant to hold us back. How in the world could the gospel still be advancing? That seems backwards in our carnal minds, doesn't it? Like if we're going to advance, if we're going to go somewhere, we can't do it in chains. Since the early church, the birth of the early church in Acts chapter two, we see the Holy Spirit come, the church birth, and they go out because of persecution to city after city, home after home. They're, they're starting st studies and churches really in their homes, the, the small groups of that time, so to speak. We start to see this taking place. There's been persecution, but the reality is, is that nothing can stop the the, the proclamation, the sharing of the gospel. This, people have tried for generations and for thousands of years and nothing stops it. It still goes on. I was talking with a mentor of mine this last week. He works with a mission organization that has missionaries all over the world, sometimes in really challenging parts of the world. Areas that you could lose your life or found, find yourself in prison for sharing the gospel. And you may have heard this, but he said that missionaries, specifically in the Muslim world, they're walking into these Muslim villages to, to start a work and they're having people come up to him and say, listen, I keep having this dream about this man named Jesus. Can you tell me about him? I mean, think about that for a moment. Even in areas where we're not supposed to share the gospel, the work of God is still going forward. God is still putting it into the hearts of men of what his work and what he's done and what he's accomplished. So no matter what, Paul is saying, listen, I'm in chains. But what is going on here is that the advancement of the gospel is still going on. It can't be stopped. God is always providing us with opportunities to proclaim and to share the gospel. I would say that most of us, that seems harsh, I understand, but most of us aren't looking for those opportunities. But if we will pay attention to them, if we will look at them and look for them, we're going to be surprised. Are we looking at circumstances or are we looking at opportunities? I'm too busy. I'm not bold enough. I don't have enough knowledge. All the things that we can come up with, are we paying attention to the circumstances or are we looking at opportunities? I love verse 13. Let's look at that again. One verse 13. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest of my, and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, this <clears throat> imperial guard that Paul mentions here were a, were a very specific group of elite soldiers in Rome. These were the special forces of their time, these Roman soldiers, 9,000 of them to be exact. This group of soldiers held great power in Rome. They sometimes even controlled who was in power. If you read history, you might see people like Claudius or even Nero's reign was led largely by this group of elite soldiers called the Imperial Guard. And Paul says, they know why I'm in prison. It's for Christ. Now, chains were normally a sign of who was in control of you, who owned you at that moment. We see it as a restriction, but Paul saw it as an opportunity. That because of his chains, because of where he found himself, that the entire imperial guard now knows that Paul is a prisoner for Christ. They know the message that he is proclaiming. A pastor friend of mine, Gavin Carrier, he's on staff at Faith Bible, he said, that, said it this way, that the captive has a captive audience. That the captive and Paul had a captive audience as, as the imperial, imperial guard was checking on him and looking at him and paying attention to him. He had this captive audience he could continually preach the gospel to. Think about this for a moment. What do you think would happen if a guard came to check on Paul and says something like, I see that Caesar, Caesar has you in chains now, that Caesar owns you now. And Paul responds with something like, it is not because of Caesar that I find myself here, it's because of Jesus. And I want to tell you about him. Think of the boldness that that would take. Think of the courage that would take to look at this strong, elite group of soldiers that held a lot of authority and power in Rome. And now Paul is using that as an opportunity. We can either look at circumstances around us and make excuses, or we can see our circumstances as an opportunity to preach the gospel. Maybe it's an interruption for you. 
Maybe it's waiting in a line as we're socially separating that normally you didn't have to wait in a line to get into that store and God's placing you next to somebody six feet away, right? Placing you near somebody so that you can share the gospel with them. Maybe, maybe that interruption that is frustrating to us is an opportunity. Is there something in your life that is taking you captive that is keeping you from sharing boldly and talking boldly about the love and the grace of Jesus? Is there something there? Just ask yourself that. Lord, is there something in my life that is keeping me captive, but I'm looking at the circumstances and not paying attention to the opportunities? Let's look at verse 14. Verse 14, he says this, and most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, if you were a part of the early church and you heard Paul was now in chains, I would imagine that it would kind of damper things. I would imagine it's like, man, what are we supposed to do now? What do we get? Our apostle, our leader, the one that planted our church, he's in chains and we need to make sure, hey guys, we should probably make sure that we don't do anything to put ourselves in chains either because that seems like a bad idea. I imagine there was some conversation like, wow, we didn't think that Paul was gonna end up in chains and this is, I don't know, did we sign up for this? But then you hear that, this, I hear a report that Paul was using this as an opportunity to preach the gospel to the imperial guard. Now that, is a different sort of set of circumstances. That's a different report, right? You hear he's in prison. That's, 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 that's challenging. But you hear that he's also preaching to the guards when he's in prison. That's encouraging and that's challenging on our own faith level. Just like it says, it emboldened. It made them much more bold. If Paul can preach from chains, surely I can preach without chains. And even if we end up in chains, then we can preach to those that we're being held captive by. There's, there's never a stopping and ending to the sharing of the gospel. Now, here's the key to this verse, in my opinion. He says this, he says, most were, in, most were more in bold. Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord in my presence and much more bold, most of them, indicating this, not all of them, showing us that, that we have a choice. You and I have a choice to make that we can look around at the circumstances and be motivated to share the good news or we can look at them and glorify the problems. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of the most that was more bold rather than the few that were not empowered and emboldened by that. This reminds me of how kids play and respond to each other. There's so many correlations there. I know we, like, we grow and we mature but you think back to when you were a child, if there was something that you were, you were with a group of friends and something seemed a little bit dangerous, there's always one, one kid in a group of friends that is the first to do it, always. It's like they have no fear. They're not worried about getting hurt. They just, they're the first to go. They, they just jump in and they make it happen. It's like that, that kid becomes the, the, the sacrificial lamb for their friends. Like if he gets hurt, then we're not gonna do it, right? But... If he does it and he has fun, what happens? All the other kids line up and they start doing the same thing. Like, no, this is fun. I can do that. It's kind of this sense that I get from Paul. It's like, hey, I'm in prison. I'm in chains, but I'm using it as an opportunity to preach the gospel. It's like, you imagine hearing that for the first time as an early church member in Philippian, in, in, in Philippi, in this letter to the Philippians, like, man, I've got some boldness inside of me now because I'm sharing the gospel, not being ashamed but here's, here's the cool thing. When we do that, when we live with that kind of boldness, when we live with that kind of power, that kind of courage in us, it encourages people around us to do the same. It encourages people to do the same. He, God, wants to use you and I to encourage others to be bold with their faith as well. I'm not saying we have to go to HUB with a bullhorn and preach down every aisle. That's not what I'm saying. If you want to do that, great, but be loving and gracious with it. You might get kicked out. You might even be arrested, but I don't know if you can call it persecution. But if we live our lives with boldness, not ashamed of what Christ has done in us and through us and the work that he's accomplished, and it encourages other people around us. I don't know if you have a friend like that that... Uh, they just encourage you in that area. Have a, have a good friend. He's, he's like this. He, like everywhere he goes, he's talking about God. He's talking about church. He's, uh, he's got a funny accent though. He's South African. You may know him, but he's that guy to me. Like every time I'm around this person, he's, he, he's laughing because he's in the room with me. 
He's, he encourages me. It's like, man, like, I just, I want to, I want to go out and I want to share more. I'm like, maybe you should be the pastor, right? <laughs> like it just encourages me and makes me more bold. It's like, I want to be more like that. When we live our life with boldness, when we live our life with a courage, not war, not worried about what people think or say, none of that. But it's like, man, when we realize what God has done to us and we live with this boldness and courage, it encourages those around us. So maybe you find yourself today as somebody that needs to be encouraged you need to put yourself around people like that. You need to surround yourself, get in community with other believers that will encourage you to be bold in your faith. And maybe you're the one that's bold all the time. Keep doing it. Because those of us that can wrestle with insecurities or be a little bit more shy or more introverted, we need to be around people that are encouraging us. So let's do it together. Let's, let's be this bold, faith-walking church full of believers that we're not ashamed of what God has done in us. Let's look at verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I, put them, that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. This is such an interesting verse because Paul doesn't say that these men are sheep and wool, are wolves in sheep clothing. These aren't like people that are trying to infiltrate the church in, an, in a negative sense in that way. But these are brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Like these are, these are pastors, these are brothers in Christ and they're preaching out of envy and rival, rivalry. The difference was their attitude towards Paul. They saw it maybe as an opportunity to gain influence, maybe as an opportunity to gain a following around them now that Paul's finally in chains. Now, now maybe we can have a following like Paul. Paul's been getting all this credit. You ever found yourself wanting more credit? You ever found yourself wanting more attention, like being noticed more? That's kind of the sense that I get from these preachers. They're preaching Christ from envy and rivalry. What does this look like in our time? It looks like churches and leaders that are competitive, that aren't worried about building God's kingdom, but they're worried about building their own kingdom. They're, they're, they, they see other churches as threats when the new church moves into, it, moves into the area. They see it as a threat. They don't like it. They don't want them there. We've got enough churches in our area. This is thankfully not what we see in Magnolia. We have a great relationship with other pastors. We've been welcomed. I meet uh, when we're not in social separation, I meet monthly with the local pastors in Magnolia. We have a great relationship, a great group of guys that encourages me and loves on us as a church and, and wants to help us. But there are churches that do that. They Yes, they still love Jesus. Yes, they are still called to preach the gospel. But our prayer is that churches and leaders would not be motivated more by their own kingdom or a number on a Sunday, but they would be motivated to build the, king, the kingdom of God that they would work together with other churches so that we can reach our cities because no one church is gonna be able to reach a city completely. It takes all kinds of different churches. It takes different personalities, different, different, different theological beliefs. It takes different methods and motives and, and, and reasons. And so we've gotta look around our city and say, man, let's work together to reach our area. But it's not just other churches and leaders. It can be us as individuals as well envious and rivalry. Have you ever seen another church growing and you think to yourself, I wonder why my church isn't growing like that? I want my church to grow like that. Instead, we should be thinking, what am I doing for the kingdom? How am I, how is my family helping to grow the kingdom of God? When we look at others and their growth and, and what's going on in their church and in their faith and in their community, we do ourselves a disservice. We become envious and it turns into something that God did never designed for us to have as a church. These people are preaching the gospel with envy and rivalry against Paul. Verse 26. In verse 26, if you think back, uh, sorry, not verse 26, but you think back to the first passage here that we were on last week. It says, I want you to have knowledge and I want you to have discernment. You should have knowledge, 
and I want you to have discernment, that love would abound and knowledge and discernment would grow in you. Here's, here's the difference. Look, the wise ones knew that Paul was preaching, wasn't there, that wasn't in prison, excuse me, he wasn't there in prison to defend himself. He was in prison to preach the gospel. The wise ones, because they had knowledge and they had discernment, they knew why Paul was there. He's there for chains. He's not there for any other reasons. He was there for an opportunity to share the gospel. They are preaching it out of love, knowing why Paul's in prison. Now, verse 17, the verse that I was trying to point out a second ago, says this, the former. So you have those that are preaching with love and honor towards Paul, sharing the gospel. And you have verse 17, the former, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. Not, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my pr- imprisonment, selfish ambition or self-serving. Preaching the greatest message that there has ever been, but preaching it with the wrong motives, preaching it for their own interests. We should never find ourselves in a place as communicators, as, as preachers, as church members that we are preaching the gospel to serve our own interests. Listen, I, w- I want you to hear me so clearly. I would love for Collective Church to grow. But over the last couple of years, I've had this process in me of, of God just washing that out of me, that this desire to have this church that is a certain number or a certain size. Listen, if, if God calls Collective Church to be a church of 100 for the rest of its life, and we get to shepherd and love and grow with you, then great. That's a gift. If God wants our church to grow, then we're going to grow. But we are not here to serve our own self-interest to say, look how big my church is or look how many numbers we have. That is not what we are doing. I'm not against big churches. I love big churches. I've served on big churches. They do a lot for the kingdom. That's not what I'm preaching against. What I'm preaching against is self-serving attitudes where I say, "I, I do this because I want to grow. Because I want to see my influence grow. They're preaching, these people were preaching for their own interest. And then he says, thinking, says, thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. That word thinking could be translated as supposing, which is a really good translation for that word right there in the Greek. Remember, the wise, what did they do? They knew because they had wisdom and discernment. Back to last week's message, the passage last week, they had wisdom, they were were growing in love and wisdom and discernment. They knew because they had that. The others preached out of selfish ambition because they supposed. I want you to hear hear me really clearly, clearly. The gap between supposing and knowing is really large, especially when it comes to something like this. The gap between supposing and knowing is large. We need to grow in our knowledge and our discernment, not just suppose. We say, Lord, I want to grow in you and your, in, in your wisdom so that I can make right decisions. The wise were preaching out of love and respecting Paul The others were trying to afflict him. Let's look at verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. In that I rejoice. I love this verse. This verse, I'm telling you, is so strong that even even when people preach the gospel with wrong motives, Paul's saying, I rejoice in the fact that the message of Christ is still going forward. Think about that for a moment. We put so much of the pressure on ourselves, like I'm going to mess it up. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the, 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 the personality for that. We It's I, 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 and what Paul is saying, listen, even if the message is preached in the wrong motives, I'm thankful because the message of Jesus is still going forward. Listen, I, I've shared this story multiple times. When we were in Cuba, a friend of mine, Modesto, pastor there, great, great guy, loves the Lord, reaching people. And I didn't know what I was doing. We got to Cuba and, they, and we're walking around this community. I thought he was just giving me a tour. We meet this lady and he leans over to me and says, preach the gospel to her. It was the worst gospel presentation I think that has ever been given in the history of mankind. But here's the thing, even in our 
even in our insecurities, even in our brokenness, even in those moments where when you feel like you've really messed it up, like I, I just messed up the sharing of the gospel. It was horrible. God still uses that. He still takes those seeds that you are planting. Somebody else is going to come along. They're going to water that seed. Somebody else is going to come along. Gonna, they're going to add to that seed that you planted. Paul's saying, listen, man, even, even when somebody's preaching with the wrong motives, I'm thankful because the message of Christ is still going forward. Circumstances didn't keep Paul from, from proclaiming the gospel and it shouldn't stop us. Circumstances did not keep Paul from pre- proclaiming the gospel and it shouldn't stop us. What is it that is keeping you from living your life boldly for the Lord? Is it insecurity? Is it fear that you're going to say the wrong thing? Is it you feel not qualified enough? Uh, this week we started, this last week we started our gospel workshop that we, we were promoting and talk about. There's still time to join if you would like to. Um, but wow, it was unbelievable. Just the encouragement as we start working together and talking about how we how, how the kingdom of God grows and how we share the gospel. It was a powerful time, but so we are gonna, we're gonna equip ourselves, right? We're gonna do what we need to do to become more confident, to feel like, hey, I can be a part of this. But I think a lot of times, I believe a lot of times, we are trying to will ourselves to boldness. We try to embolden ourselves. I don't think that's something that the Lord ever called us to do. We try to make ourselves bold when it's the Holy Spirit's role to make us more bold. Let's look at Acts chapter one, verse eight. You can just write it down there. It's a very popular verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit came so that we could be empowered, so that we can become witnesses in our Jerusalem, which is Magnolia, which is Montgomery, which is Conroe. We start seeing these areas around us. That is where we start to see the boldness come out. So maybe for you today, is that you've been trying to make yourself bold when you just need to sit in the presence of God and ask the Holy Spirit to do what his role is, to empower us, to embolden us, to give us the strength that we need, to give us the words that we need to say. You've been trying to do it on your own and God is so gracious and so loving. He's been working with you and working with us, but he wants to say to you today, let the Holy Spirit do his role in you. Let him embolden you. 